the Vatican formally recognizes Palestine. Welcome to Skywatch TV. It's Monday, January 4th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. It's a new year and a new political dynamic in the Middle East is now official. The Vatican announcing over the weekend that its comprehensive agreement with the state of Palestine has now gone into full effect. This was signed last June. The treaty gives the Roman Catholic Church rights and privileges in Palestinian territories in exchange for the church brokering a two-state solution with Israel. It's also said to safeguard Christian holy sites in Palestine. Now, there have been suspicions circulating on the Internet for years that the Vatican has been conspiring with Israeli elites to turn control of Jerusalem over to the Vatican. And that's not entirely conspiracy theory. The Vatican has wanted administrative control over the old city and the Temple Mount for at least a century. In fact, because of its lobbying, the 1947 United Nations Partition Plan included a proposal to designate Jerusalem as uh, corpus separatum, or separated body, an independent territory, sort of like Washington, D.C., except under international control, led by the Vatican, of course. Uh, that plan never went into effect because war broke out when Israel's Arab neighbors attacked almost immediately after Israel declared its independence in 1948. Uh, elsewhere in the Middle East, tensions have reached a new level between Sunnis and Shias, on Saturday, Saudi Arabia executed 47 people it called terrorists, including leading Shiite cleric Nimr al-Nimr. Sheikh Nimr and three other Shiites were executed along with men linked to al-Qaeda by the Saudi kingdom. Uh, Sheikh Nimr led anti-government protests in the eastern part of the country in 2011 and 2012, part of the uh, so-called Arab Spring. The Sheikh was convicted of sedition, disobedience, and bearing arms. On his part, Sheikh Nimr declared declined or denied, rather, uh, calling for violence or carrying weapons. His biggest crime actually might have been mocking the former interior minister, Saudi Prince Nayef bin Abdulaziz. Shortly after the prince died in 2012, Sheikh Nimr said he will be eaten by worms and suffer the torments of hell in the grave. The man who made us live in fear and terror, shouldn't we rejoice at his death? Unfortunately for the Sheikh, Prince Nayef's son, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, is the new interior minister, and it's his office that carries out death sentences in Saudi Arabia. Sheikh Nimr was considered the most popular Shiite, Shiite cleric among the youth in Saudi Arabia, and his execution led to immediate protests in eastern Saudi Arabia and across the Muslim world from Bahrain to Pakistan. Iran, which of course is a majority Shia nation, said that the Saudi government will pay a heavy price, and Ayatollah Khamenei said, divine vengeance will befall Saudi politicians. Protesters in Tehran broke into the Saudi embassy there and set it on fire Saturday night. In response, the Saudi kingdom has severed diplomatic ties with Iran. Bahrain followed suit. Even though Bahrain is majority Shia, its government is dominated by Saudi Arabia. And certainly this adds fuel to the ongoing sectarian wars in the Middle East, which are taking place even as I speak in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. This may also be a destabilizing influence in Saudi Arabia. You see, to balance its budget, which is suffering because of the low price of oil, which is mainly due to the fact that the Saudis are pumping as much oil as they can get out of the sand to put a hurt on Iran and Russia, uh, the Saudis last week cut government subsidies to its citizens for things like electricity, gasoline, and water. So a Shia uprising right now might find some sympathetic Sunnis who are upset that their budgets are being impacted by Saudi budget cuts. This is something to watch because if we've learned nothing else over the last 15 years in the Middle East, it's that every time a stable Middle Eastern government falls, it's replaced by something more violent and less friendly to the West and to Israel. And regarding Syria, the United States military apparently did an end run around the White House in order to short circuit the Obama administration's policy of replacing Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch in a new article published at the London Review of Books reports that in 2013, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were so upset by the administration's plan for regime change and support for radical Islamic groups like the one that morphed from Al-Qaeda in Iraq to the Islamic State, that in spite of a steady stream of warnings from the Defense Intelligence Agency about the consequences of deposing Bashar al-Assad, the Joint Chiefs, says Hirsch, knew that challenging Obama's policy would have zero chance of success, so they began taking steps against the radical jihadist groups in Syria and Iraq, 
without going through political channels. They began sharing military intelligence with their colleagues in the militaries of Russia, Germany, and Israel in the hopes that that information would make its way to the Syrian army and that Bashar al-Assad and his advisors would be smart enough to use it to fight against the jihadists trying to take him down. Now, if Hirsch's story is accurate, this is a remarkable development. This is seven days in May type stuff. What Hirsch is describing is something that is very, very close to treason on the part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, deliberately attempting to short circuit a White House policy, even though, and I agree with the Joint Chiefs on this point, even though the policy is really stupid. Now, Mr. Hirsch has been around for a long time. He's got some journalistic chops. He won the 1970 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for his coverage of the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam in 2004. He reported on the abuse of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison. And last year, he reported on the Obama administration's official story of the killing of Osama bin Laden. And in Hirsch's words, it was one big lie that was concocted to cover up the assistance of the Pakistani government, uh, which played a key role. Uh, for example, not shooting down the helicopters carrying SEAL Team 6 to Abbottabad. Uh, and also to yield maximum political benefits to President Obama during his re-election campaign leading up to 2012's presidential election. Interestingly, the American press basically ignored that story, just ran a few hit pieces on Mr. Hirsch himself, and so far the American press is ignoring this story as well, which again, if it's true, is huge. One final story, a group of armed militiamen have occupied a forest reserve building in rural Oregon. The situation developed Saturday after a peaceful protest in the town of Burns, Oregon, over the federal government's treatment of a pair of ranchers, father and son Dwight and Stephen Hammond. The two men were sentenced to five years in prison each for starting a backfire on their land several years ago to control the spread of a wildfire that had been ignited by lightning that threatened their property. Well, the fires that they set spread to the federally owned land, and even though the ranchers put out the fires themselves, they were tried as terrorists. Convictions, of course, carry a minimum sentence of at least five years. Now, there's a lot of backstory here that we don't have time to get into, but based on what I've read, it's pretty clear to me anyway that the feds have been trying to force the Hammonds off their property for years, and this is just the latest step in this ongoing battle between the Hammond family and the federal government. Well, after the protest by their supporters, peaceful protest in Burns on Saturday, a group of militiamen led by the sons of Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy went south to the Mallor National Wildlife Refuge, about 35 miles south of Burns, and took over the headquarters building there. The militiamen claim they've got 150 men on the property, but a couple who delivered food to the HQ building told reporters that it looked more like about 15 men. Bundy and his followers had an armed standoff, you might remember, with the federal government in Nevada in 2014 over grazing rights on federal land. Ammon and Ryan Bundy, their brother Mel also there with them, uh, told reporters that their goal is to turn control of the land back over to ranchers, loggers, and miners. And they're prepared to stay at the wildlife refuge for years if that's what it takes, and they're calling for other U.S. patriots to join them. Now, the Hammonds have released a statement through their attorney. Uh, both men, uh, Stephen and his father, uh, surrendering themselves to authorities today to begin serving their sentence. And they say through their attorney that the militiamen do not represent them or speak for the Hammond family. Now, at the risk of poking a hornet's nest here, because I've been accused of being unpatriotic for pointing out that Romans 13 suggests that we Christians should obey government authorities, and pointing out that the apostles, when they were writing verses like Romans 13, lived during an era when they were under the rule of men like Nero and Caligula. That said, let me be very clear that in reading the stories of the Bundy family and the Hammond family, I am sympathetic to their causes. It does appear from the accounts that I've read that both families are getting a raw deal from the federal government. Just two observations. Number one, from a tactical standpoint, the federal government will always have more men, more supplies, and more guns available for a situation like this. From a tactical standpoint, I don't see what the Bundys hope to accomplish. And I can see a number of scenarios in which things end very badly for many of those connected to this standoff. But secondly, as Christians, we have to look at the 
scriptural command regarding our relationship to the government. And yes, I know that the government is often wrong and unjust in its dealings, just as the Roman Empire and the Jewish ruling authorities, the Sanhedrin, were unjust in the time of Jesus and the apostles. Just as Christians, as we evaluate our opinions of what's happening here and a proper response, before we let our emotions carry us to a conclusion that is unscriptural, we turn to the Bible and use that as our guide. Well, certainly the overreach of government authority is one of the issues that we'll be watching here at Skywatch TV in 2016. There are already some indications that the president will attempt to use his executive authority or rather abuse his executive authority in order to restrict the right of Americans to own guns. Tomorrow night on Skywatch TV on the Christian Television Network, we take a look at some of the other issues that we'll be facing in 2016. The transhumanist movement, of course, the geopolitical situation in the Middle East, and of course, another American election, which we Christians will be told, as we've been told, every election since 1992 is the most importantest election ever. That's our discussion tomorrow night on Skywatch TV. Tom Horn and Sharon K. Gilbert join me for that discussion. Uh, that will air at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time on the Christian Television Network. That's UTC minus five for our overseas viewers. Of course, middle of the night in Europe, but uh, late morning if you're in Australia or the Far East. Uh, not only does it air on uh, DirecTV channel 376 and Dish Network channel 267, Glory Star Satellite channel 117, it will stream live to the internet at the Christian Television Network's website. That's ctnonline.com. Here's a way you can support Skywatch TV in 2016 that doesn't cost you a penny. Just a simple click on one of our tweets, Facebook posts, or YouTube videos can share those messages with people who might benefit from our somewhat unique perspective on world events. Again, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Links to all of those sites where you'll find us on the internet are at our website, skywatchtv.com. And remember, just a click to share will help spread the message around the internet. And if you're curious about what I'm thinking on various things, because I do have a deep psychological need to make my opinion known, you'll find me on the internet here, Twitter, Facebook, and my own website. And of course, you've comments, questions, or suggestions for us here at Skywatch TV. Send those to dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. Welcome to the new year. We're happy to be back and looking forward to an exciting year. And we thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV.